My family is from the Virgin Islands, and uh, I went to law school here in D.C., undergrad here in D.C., um, was a prosecutor in New York, and then came back to D.C. and worked in the administration, at the Justice Department, and other jobs as a lawyer. And um, uh, But my heart has always been in the Virgin Islands. That's you, you, Although I was raised in New York, and you talk to my parents who have been there from the 50s, uh, I still have to translate for my father because his accent is so thick, and that's really our home. So I felt in the early 2000s that I, hey, you know, I'm at a place in time in my life where I could move back home and give back in that sense. Uh, my older sons were transitioning to college, you know, some were away in high school or boarding school, and my youngest had not started school as yet. So I thought that this was a prime opportune, opportune time to do that. Uh, and I went back thinking that I'm going to give in nonprofits, maybe be on some boards, I'll work in a law firm, uh, and I'll write a book. And I come from a political family. Our family um, were organizers of, pol of politics in the Virgin Islands. Uh, my uncles helped to found the Democratic Party in the Virgin Islands. Uh, we've been known to go into cane fields, organizing cane workers as labor unions. But we were always the types that felt that the people sitting on the couch with the pads were a little more important than the actual politicians out in front. And so never really saw myself in that sense, but really became frustrated by what I saw, um, thought that new energy was needed, and decided to offer myself up. You know, the first time I ran, I was not successful. My belief is that the Virgin Islands is a very unique place. We have given a lot to this country, from Alexander Hamilton to Denmark Vesey. Uh, we really care deeply about being a part of the American experience. When we became uh, part of the U.S., we petitioned to be part of the draft because we wanted the responsibilities, but we have not gotten the benefit all the time. And so I felt that a really strong voice needed to be heard to say that. Uh, like Eleanor Holmes Norton, I don't have a vote on the floor, but I always go to the floor when everyone is there because I know that's where the decisions are made. I also wanted members to see a black woman who was not the traditional sense of a politician, in that maybe someone who came up through the ranks in state politics and um, you know civil rights and social justice issues, that my expertise is really in economic development and public finance law, which is something very different, and I think it gives a well-rounded view to the Congressional Black Caucus and even to the Women's Caucus that I'm a part of. That's our story as black women in America, is always having these other things, these um, differences that set us apart. But I think that it allows me to see things very differently than others. Um, I, I believe that throughout my life, I've always been a token. You know, um, we, I grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, but I went to all white schools in the better part of Brooklyn. And so this kind of duality and this ability to move between cultures all the time is something that I bring to Congress as well. I'm a Caribbean American, but I'm very much a black American as well. Uh, for me, one of the top issues is jobs. Uh, I really go back to all things are economic. You know, that that's where you're going to see the starkest equality in this country is when it comes down to money. It's a really hard one. Um, and, I, and, I, and people ask me how I did it, and I don't know how I did it. I, you just do it in the same way that our mothers did what they did. You know, how many of us, I didn't have a mother who stayed at home. I had a mother who worked all the time and called me up after school and made sure that I took the chicken out uh, and did I have my snack, but made it to the meetings that she needed to at my school because that's just what we do. And I'm grateful for the community that we have, uh, friends, 
that create the family that we have as well as my family that was there for me. You know, I, it's funny because I've asked my older sons, so how much do you feel really bad that mom wasn't there all the time to, you know, be at your school, be part of the PTA? And one of them looked at me and said, mom, nobody wants you around 24-7 <laughs> on a regular basis anyway. My favorite book is, um, I have two. One is Roots by Alex Haley. And I remember I read that first when I was about 10 years old. The other book is an interesting one and it's called Eureka. And it's a French book, very small, that was written 200 years ago. And it's the story of a Senegalese girl who was raised by a French family. And she was raised as a French lady, but when she becomes an adult, realizes that she's really a Senegalese slave. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, mm. uh, The Matrix. That's, I'm kind of mine. a. The Matrix is mine. I'm kind of a. I, I like the fight scenes. Our mm. national dish, which is called Kalalu, mm -hmm. and it's just like other dishes throughout the Caribbean that's an okra and spinach based soup kind of a stew and it also has crabs, it has fish, it has got to have some pigtail in there and it's got you know the smoked meats and everything that's probably the ultimate on a Saturday afternoon on St. Croix nothing's better than a pot a bowl of Kalaloo sitting on the roadside with some some of my peeps. Oh man you know I'm, I'm a child of the 70s and 80s in New York so it's all thing biggie. Barbara Jordan Shirley Chisholm, those are the women that I aspire to in the Virgin Islands, Ruby Rouse. Uh, and you know, in the Virgin Islands, we have a tradition called the Three Queens. Those were the women who rose up in the labor movement when we were still under sharecropping serfdom. I went to the same high school as John F. Kennedy. And the one phrase that people know him for was the motto of the school was ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And one of the things that I go around the country telling young people in particular is that no major movement in the history of man has ever occurred until young people are involved. Tiananmen Square, the Arab Spring, the Civil Rights Movement, the end of apartheid, it's all through the movement of young people. Um, we can guide you, but it's up to them to to be the energy and the spark for that. And so I would ask them to be our energy for the correction of the American dream.